Herb is the director of the Feinstein International Center. About two months ago, he was the acting assistant administrator of the Humanitarian Bureau, DACHA, of USAID. He's also been the senior deputy in the Food Security Bureau, um, mission director in Pakistan, mission director in Namibia, worked for FUSE a long time ago. He's got a long history uh, in development work with AID. And so he's going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> his career and the changes he's seen over the past 30 years. Is that right? About 30 years. And uh, so without further ado, Greg, over to you. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here, everybody. Thank you guys for showing up. Um, as Bill said, so I had a long and tortured path to get sitting here today. Um, I also was a lawyer at one point. So I'll try to navigate that, how I got from doing that to how I got here. Um, so I think when I, when I was sort of starting out, I, as a kid, I, 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 if you'd have told me that I'd end up here, I, I, I never would have figured that would happen. My father would actually understand that I, I'm now a professor at Tufts, and that was the, that's the one job he understood. He understood I was a lawyer, and when I quit being a lawyer, he just couldn't understand what I did for the next 25 years. So, Dad, if you're listening, you know. Uh, so it's a, you go into, you leave something that's, um, uh, that you can envision, like you're a lawyer or something like that, to go to a field in which I had no insight at all. And for me, it was, um, it was kind of sim um, serendipitous that I ended up doing this work. Uh, I didn't get started in it until the, well, it tells you how old I am, but 1981 was my first posting. But I was fortunate uh, to meet someone who was one of the first people um, ever hired by the UN. So 1944 actually went out to Palestine during World War II. So early on in my career uh, through him, I actually helped him write his memoirs. Um, but what I began to learn was that there was a whole field out there and there was a history to that field. And that's one of the things that's always fascinated me about this business is that, you know, when you get into it, you think, oh, I, I'm, look at me, I'm a pioneer. When in fact, uh, people have been doing humanitarian assistance for a long time, just in different ways, right? So I was very fortunate to, to meet um, this guy and um, I ended up talking my, talking care into hiring me. Um, I think, one of the big changes, of course, these days is that people are much better prepared to go do humanitarian assistance. But in those days, it was still pretty much um, kind of, uh, you know, if you wanted to go try to do it, you, you went and did it. So I, um, I talked my way into it, and I thought I was actually going to go do development in Uganda, and I ended up uh, in the middle of the Civil War, right? Idi Amin had been ousted, if you remember Idi Amin. Um, and he was replaced by the previous president, Milton Obote, who then proceeded to kill another 300, 350,000 people. Um, and so I, be, I started to do humanitarian relief. And I think I kind of recognized that uh, a couple of things in myself that kept me going in the field. One was that in humanitarian assistance, um, it's one of the, one of the uh, I think, important things to be able to do is to make decisions very quickly. Uh, and I seem to have had that ability. Two, I wasn't bothered by gunfire, which was another, uh, which seemed to matter a great deal. Um, although I've subsequently pulled people out of countries because they didn't respond to the gunfire. But, um, but I think that was, and, I, and the other thing was, I, I actually, I loved being uh, in Africa. I, I, I fell in love with it and spent more than 20 years of my life there. So um, there were a couple of those things that were really very important to me, but I got into it because of an individual who persuaded me that that would be something to do. Um, I, I then went on to Bangladesh, but I, I actually, went back and practiced law because I thought, you know, I've spent money and I've done this and I put the effort in. But a few years into that, I kind of decided I, I really, I, I really want to go back out. And so what I did was I went to the Kennedy School. Some of you may have been there. 
and studied, really studied development. I didn't really study humanitarian assistance because you couldn't study it. Nobody was teaching it back in the 80s. Um, and then I was lucky to meet um, someone that is well known in, well, people that are as old as me and Bill and Mike, um, a woman named Julia Taft, actually, who offered me my first job in USAID. And I went out to work in Malawi and uh, to do uh, work on refugees and floods and things like that. And I never looked back from there. So I had a, I was fortunate, uh, I did a few things in between. I was a protection officer for the UN out in Malaysia with Vietnamese boat people. I was out there for a year doing that. Uh, as Bill said, I was fortunate enough to run the famine early warning system for Tulane University. Uh, and each of those steps along the way taught me, gave me more insight into the field. To be a protection officer on the coast of Malaysia when boats were pitching up meant that I began to deal with the, I had to deal with the Malaysian military not just to oppose them and their uh, desire to push people back out to sea, because for many people that was a death sentence, um, but to then collaborate with them uh, on the review of refugee cases. It was a complicated thing about what happened with Vietnam, but the fact is that early on in my career, I began to deal with the military, even in Uganda, but it was uh, a little different there. But it, the fact is that when I look at where we were before, relations to the military, and where we are now with the military, early on, I began to see that, you know, we could work with them. Um, and eventually, I came back to USAID. Um, for many years, I was a contractor and didn't join permanently for a while. But I would say, for me, what was really important, and maybe it'll be the same for you as you go through your career, but I felt like there were people that I met in my career who um, believed in the work I did, uh, and I found them to be uh, mentors. Bill was one of them. Bill was actually the first person I ever met in USAID, other than Julia. Um, and Andrew Natsios, who um, kept promoting me up through the system. And, um, and another guy from Fuse, uh, from Tulane, a guy named Bill Bertrand, a professor down there. And I felt that I've had in my career the ability to talk to people about my career who knew what we were doing, recognized what my strengths were uh, when I worked for them, gave me the ability to, um, to do my work without much oversight, gave me the chance to go out, do what I had to do. Mike Hess would let me do that when I was his deputy. Um, and I, I would say that as you look for how you want to work, uh, I think working for someone uh, who, is, uh, who lets you do that, doesn't look over your shoulder. In other words, even if you make a mistake, it's not fatal. That's what it is to go out and learn and grow. So I think I was lucky that I had those kinds of, um, I've had those kinds of people during my career that have, um, that have seen my, um, my potential. So, um, uh, so I would say, you know, as you go through your career, think about that. Um, so that's a little bit. So as you know, I gradually just, I was lucky at aid. I was very fortunate to, um, I was a senior deputy assistant administrator twice, acting assistant administrator. And I was lucky that I also got to do a variety of things. I was mission director in a mission that had uh, HIV AIDS. So I got to learn a lot about HIV AIDS. Um, I was a deputy in the Office of Transition Initiatives, um, which was, gave me insight into the politics of, of, um, of development and humanitarian assistance, which was something that I really would say I hadn't thought about much because I was intent on doing humanitarian assistance under the, big, the, the, the principles of humanitarian assistance. But I think post 9-11, anybody that didn't begin to think in, a, in political terms was not going to be able to do their job in a way that was coherent within the, the US government. So um, that's a little bit about how I kind of advanced. And I would say that if you're thinking about USAID, I mean, I was very fortunate in that I was allowed to do a number of things. But I would say that what was most important was that 
because I did both emergencies, I'd done the technical work in early warning, I was able to do political transitions, I've done HIV, I've worked on, in Pakistan I've worked on energy, I worked on counterterrorism, uh, major education programs. It's that variety, I think, that uh, helped me to um, sort of bring something else to each new job that, I, uh, that I, I was in. And I think in the development world, writ large, um, I think people that understand a variety of things are in a much better place to, to bring uh, value to, their, to your programs. Um, because you can be out in the field doing humanitarian assistance, but you may be really in a transition time. And so it's that person that understands, so if you understand what that means and you can speak that language and you can, you can understand how you should adapt your programs, I think you, you become a better humanitarian. Likewise, if you're on the development side, not understand, or, or failing to understand um, humanitarian needs, principles, um, is, can be fatal to your programs, right, if you don't see it coming. So that's a little bit about how I got to where I was. I wanted to focus on two uh, other things, and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, I think the last, well, for most of my career, I have found myself in a management position. And like many people, uh, you know, I had some uh, successes and I had some, um, let's call them not successes, um, that I think I learned from over the years um, about how to manage people. Whether, certainly when I managed in the UN, um, one of the tricky things was how do you manage in a multicultural institution, right? People come, they don't, they're not, everybody's not American, they don't see the world the way you see it, they don't write the way you see, uh, they, they have a different approach. And I think that was a really important thing for me to learn because as I moved up um, and I found myself chairing meetings, international meetings, um, I had a much better, I, had, I think I had, I was more sensitive to making sure that I was um, approaching my colleagues in the right way that was more sensitive to the way they had to work. If, particularly if you think about somebody that's, I'm gonna just do this, thanks. Um, like if you're in the European Union or something, you have your own um, sort of political ways that you have to move through your system. And I think trying to, over the years, I'm trying to understand that was important. But for me, the last, I'd say dozen years um, or more were in, very senior leadership positions. So the last job was in DCHA, so we have a thousand people. Our budget has grown to five and a half billion dollars. So you are, you're a leader. You're not a tech, I, for me, I was no longer really a technical person. I understood the business. I understood how to ask questions, but that wasn't what I was, that wasn't my value anymore for aid. My value for aid was I was a, a manager, a leader. And, um, and I think that even if you're just starting out in your career, everybody at one point, uh, you're gonna manage something, whether it's two people, 10 people, or whatever. But you, many people that I have worked with over the years, particularly when I was in the famine or the warning system, said, I don't wanna manage anybody, right? I don't wanna do, I just wanna do my technical thing. And you can do that if you have those technical skills. But unless you are, um, you know, a person that sits at a drafting table or you are the, uh, you know, the meteorology person that looks at the screens and says, okay, this is, the storm is coming, you know, get ready. Uh, and we have those people. And if you go to the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, we have those people, right? That Those jobs exist. But I, for me, what became of great interest to me uh, because I had good mentors who were good managers, um, that's what I began to focus on, and it's what I, uh, it's what I'll teach up at Tufts, where I am now, as leadership. Because I feel like it's important that you understand that no matter what the size of that group, you, they look to you for leadership, and the question is how you treat your staff. And I think for me, I was, um, I must have done relatively well because they kept asking me to go. Uh, lead more things. But I think it's, uh, I had a strong sense of seeing um, 
how to manage well because I'd seen a lot of, I'd also seen bad managers. Uh, I'd seen bad managers who managed through fear and not through um, inquiry. Uh, I had seen people that, you know, I'd seen the worst of um, very poor decisions on um, gender bias, on um, gender violence, uh, and I've dealt with that many times. And so I think over the years, you never stop learning about what it is to be a good manager. And I think part of it is to be sensitive to also what's going on in the world with you, what's growing. For instance, at AID, I think when Bill and I were in AID, um, we probably had hardly any senior leaders who were women other than Julia Taft. We had very few. Now if you go to AID, AID is more than 50% women. And so that's good. We have a balance, right? When I started law school, I think 10% of the class were maybe women, 15%. And when I graduated three years later, I did graduate, um, we were almost 50%. So things began to explode in the 70s, and, and, but it means that if you're a manager, there are still there are sensitivities you have to have to see what do, you, what do you as a manager, what can you bring to those new trends, right? And recognize that. And the other thing I think that's important is, um, uh, in any good manager is, it, you will be faced with personnel issues because that's one of the biggest things you have to do and it's also one of the hardest things I think I've ever dealt with. I've fired people as, if, as, as every manager, right? It's never pleasant to do that. Even if you would love to get rid of the person, it's still a horrible thing to do. But it's getting people to move on and understanding what's best for the organization and understanding how to do that and um, because any person can any person who is uh, in a can undermine an organization if you don't if you don't take action. So for me, as you start your careers, uh, while you may not be managing people now, I hope you'll keep in mind that uh, eventually you probably will be there. And why is that important? And how do, what kind of leader do you want to be? Um, so the last thing I'll say is a little bit about the changes that I've experienced. And so, as Bill said, so I, my first assignment was in 1981. So I've been doing this for a long time uh, in many places. And a um, couple of things. First of all, when I got into disaster assistance, um, I mean, I started my career in a conflict, actually, but that wasn't the intention. But when I came to OFTA, when I finally came back to headquarters in 1991 after two evacuations, um, we had a budget of about, I don't know, $40 million or something, and I think we were maybe 20, 25 people. The organization now, just to give you an idea, is about 450 people. The budget last year was $2 billion. But 80% of that money, in the old days, most of our money went to natural disasters, right? typhoons and hurricanes and earthquakes um, and some dr and droughts. Now, 80% of the money goes to conflict. And that's, to me, one of the biggest changes I've seen. And the, the, one of the reasons that's such a big change is because it changes, it is exhausting for staff. It is exhausting because if you look at the security issues, people are hemmed in. When I was in Pakistan, which partly because of CV, you know, countering violent extremism and the presence of the Taliban. I mean, you know, our movements are incredibly restricted. So to get staff to only come in for a year at a time, it's incredibly disruptive, not only because they're always rotating out, but because they never get to know the country because you can't get outside the walls, right? So that's a big change. Before, in the, in the, in the past, you could wander freely. When I was in Uganda, I used to get in a car and drive the length and breadth of the country by myself, right? By myself, which would be unheard of now. You'd never do that, right? They'd, you'd be insane. So I think that's one of the big things that's happened. And there are implications across uh, the whole industry because you have to kind of decide, am I, am I meant for that kind of world? Uh, my sense of it is that I had some great people in places like Pakistan and elsewhere, and when I was in Haiti, and um, they weren't made for that. They were good, they had great skills, but I sent them home because they were not, they could not live and function at a high level in a confined space. 
and with one where there were lots of security issues. So I think that's one of the biggest changes I've seen. Two, money, as I said. There's so much money pouring into humanitarian assistance now that it's, um, it's silly. And it's, it's, it's needed, but it's, it changes the way that you have to manage, right? Bill now is a compliance officer. One of his jobs is he's a compliance officer for one of the big NGOs. Why? Because there's so much money there, you have the mob even now getting into it. And so I think you, you, you have to think about, well, what does that mean if I'm not just managing $150,000 or a million dollars, but you, you're managing a, uh, as uh, one of our NGOs is managing, or groups is managing, a $9.5 billion, you know, logistics program. So I think you, it means you need a whole other set of skills, right? It's not just that you're able to do a simple spreadsheet anymore. It's you have to be your own inspector general. You have to, you have, to have great sensitivity to what the, poten what the potential pitfalls are all around you. And if you don't think you're, uh, if you've got millions and millions of dollars to manage, you have to be a manager. You gotta be really aware of what's going on. And the last thing I'll say is um, the biggest change is really post 9-11, right? It is the politicization of humanitarian assistance and development particularly if you're in the U.S. government, right? We've, you, most of you have probably, you know, we, we, we know the concept of the three-legged stool, right? Where, you know, we have defense, and they got a leg that's about this big, and then diplomacy's like this, and then the development people, we have a little tiny leg. But we still have a leg of the stool. And, but it influences greatly what you can do and what you can't do. I think when Bill and I were first into the field, we, were very much in sync with a lot of other groups out there like the International Committee of the Red Cross, looking at the basic principles that overlay humanitarian assistance, right? Neutrality, independence, uh, things like that that are, that are the essentials. It's a little harder now. We still strive for that, but oftentimes we go places, and I'll, I think Iraq and Afghanistan were good examples of that, where uh, I think it's fair to say we sent our humanitarians, but it wasn't about humanitarian assistance. It was about the politics of going, right? We had a role to play, but we were connected to the generals and to the ambassadors like we'd never been connected before. And so I think whenever you're doing, when you're in the middle of a war now, like Syria, there's lots of politics going on, and you have to be uh, incredibly sensitive to that. Um, whether you're with the USG or whether you're with a partner, right? Because there are demands that come from the donor downward about what you can do. Which side of the line am I on? Which side can I operate on? Uh, and it's a real challenge. And it's a challenge not just for us and the NGOs, our NGO partners, but the UN and everybody. And I think that's one of the biggest, um, to me, that it's just a huge change. And the question is how we navigate that to serve people uh, in the best way possible, um, and it will, I, I do believe that it will remain a challenge. So as you advance in your careers, I, I think there's, there has to be a sensitivity to it. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and um, I'm taking all your questions. Well, as you think about the questions you might want to ask, I will start with one. Okay. Uh, and please, if you have a question, identify yourself and your affiliation so Greg has an idea of who he's, who he's talking to. I wonder, uh, you mentioned early on in changes and that uh, a big change is fragile states and conflict and this sort of thing um, in recent years. Does that change the skill set that's needed for people to do development assistance or humanitarian assistance? Is it different from, say, when we were doing it? What kind of skills are important? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you're right, Bill. I mean, I think that um, huge, I, I think when you're in conflict zones, you're, you need to develop those skills of, the negotiation skills are incredibly important, right? Because there's lots of difficulties that you have to navigate. So it means you're negotiating for, um, you're, you're, you're negotiating for access. I mean, we did, you, you know, we started to do this in, you know, in uh, Operation Lifeline Sudan years ago, and we began to see 
humanitarians as sort of diplomats, if you will. And I think within, in conflict, there's more and more of that, right? You serve, you, you serve dual functions. I mean, yes, I oversaw humanitarian programs in Pakistan, but as a director, I sat in that morning huddle, as you know, within the, you know, within the, the um, cone of silence. Um, and you are as much a, yeah, you're as much a diplomat as you are a development person, right? Because they're also looking for you to how you figure out problems. Um, and I think one of the big issues that aid, USAID and others, uh, and ECHO and DFID and everybody else is gonna face is, what kind of people are, you gonna, are we gonna hire in the future in aid? And I'm not saying this is what they're gonna do, but about 10 years ago, we, aid was able to, we were able to grow, we were able to add personnel after many years of a declining uh, foreign service base. Um, and we did. We hired lots of, we hired lawyers and, and uh, uh, contracts people and uh, executive officers and some health people and we had some food security people. Bill and I were running the Food Security Bureau. Um, and before I was leaving government, I, I, I was a bit of a heretic and because and, I could be a heretic by then. And I said, you know, I'm not sure we hired the right people given where I think the world is going uh, all the conflict zones we're in. I'm not sure that, I think one of the things we have to look at is, are people suited to conflict environments? To environments of limited movement, because you may work for the US government, or you may be on a security pro protocol with an NGO that simply limits your movements a lot. Which means that you aren't in the old days, you got to know the country because you could travel around it a lot. So if you can't travel around, you can't meet people, you can't get to understand their problems, how do you then, what is your job then? What is it you're looking at? And how do you make your, on what basis do you make your decisions? So I think you have to, people are going to have to be sort of fit for that kind of environment. Um, kids. Maybe you have kids, but you're not going to be able to bring them with you. So if you like to have a family, they might be staying, they might be going to private school somewhere. Spouse, spouses are good, but, um, but in a lot of places you can't bring your spouse either. Or if your spouse comes, they better do what you do, right? They have to, um, they have, to have that same kind of skill set. My, my wife fortunately had the same kind of skill set that I had. But even then, if you want to talk about dual couples, um, tandem couples, I, I got plenty on that. Um, that's also very difficult because everybody, both, both people have to have a job that makes sense for them, right? So I, I'm just, I'm not sure that what we're hiring now is what we're going to hire in the future. I really, I really no, don't think that. Great, thanks. Any questions? Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, thank you. My name is Preston. Today I just returned from working on a UCA project for RTI. Actually, like you, as a kid, I never thought I would be here because I was informed by my Peace Corps teacher to one day become a Peace Corps volunteer as a librarian. So I never thought I would ever be here. Never came across my mind. So um, I have done Peace Corps, I've done UNV, I've done other things. Humanitarian or, or, or development has been my call, thank to my Peace Corps teacher. <laughs> so I'm trying to find out for you now. Here you mentioned certain challenges that face humanitarian or, or development work, like in politics or other stuff, finance and other things. How about on the ground, when we are on the ground, in your years of work, what are some of your experience you found that was something that hindered your work on the ground? Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, I, I'll, I can talk about that from the vantage point of USG people, but, but I think it bleeds into, what I'll say is I think what happens in, in the field for us now is that we are much closer to our ambassadors, right, than we've ever been. And I'll give you a great example of that. Um, so our, uh, in Southern Sudan, so I worked on that for the last, pretty intensely the last year. Um, and as most of you know, I mean, if you've been following it, Southern Sudan is just back in, you know, it's back into war. But 
when I look at what the ambassador did, she was so involved in all of our things, right? In part because the emergency was enveloping the country. So if you're an ambassador, so you think, well, I could do my diplomatic thing, but the fact is that there wasn't much else to do in that sense. So the ambassador lent her weight to try to help us solve our problems. But I think anytime you, the more reference you make to your ambassador, there's, you have to understand that she also has a line of authority back to the department. And, there's, and there'll be political things flowing into her for her direction, right? Which is gonna come to you. And so in the past, I think ambassadors were, we, we went out and did our thing and we, that we showed up in countries and they said, oh great, we're so glad you're here, right? Go do your thing. But these days, we are so, we're, we're, we're much closer to them because these conflicts aren't just, they're, they're not just isolated. They, they can influence whether the country you know, exists or doesn't exist, right? Because it's an existential threat. So, so if you're going to be the aid person, you, you have to have a much greater sensitivity to, one, you have to know how to use your ambassador to, gr to greater effect, right? Well, it's not just go visit a project and cut the ribbon. It's, you know, when do I need that person to help me solve a problem? When do I have the ambassador go see the minister or should I go see the, you know, I'll go see the sub minister, or I'll go see the vice minister. Uh, and I think that then you, ha that means you also then have to be much more sensitive to, to what, what's the, what is the department thing? What, what's the, what are headquarters thinking about the politics here? And then you become then more involved in those broader issues, right? Your, your humanitarian issue or your development issue grows into the larger policy. And I think that's, for me, one of the big changes, is that we are, we're not just over here doing our thing. We are more and more connected to what those policies are, which means that as a development officer or emergency person, you have to have political feelers. Because if you don't, you're gonna miss those signals and you're gonna, you know, and you don't wanna disappoint your, well, you don't want to disappoint your ambassador, right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> Not some of them. Thanks. Huh? Hi. Hi. Um, so over the course of your career, as you've watched this, this government relationship between USAID and DOS evolve, as you watch DOD and DOS roles evolve on the ground, have you seen a similar evolution of NGO perspectives on the role of US government, the role of State Department, DOD? And can you comment, please? Um. Yeah, I mean, there is a bit of an evolution here. So if you're thinking about post 9-11, I mean, think about the growth of partners that are the for-profit sector, right? Um, a good example of that is, um, so in 2001, I joined um, OTI. I remember when uh, I came back from, I was living in Kenya and came back and I told Natsios, I gotta come home now. I've been out for a while and I need to come home. He said, oh. Natsios was the administrator. Oh, administrator. Andrew was our administrator at the time. He said, oh, I've got a job for you. I wanna put you in OTI. I said, great, what's OTI? And, um, but it was the right thing to do. Um, but I think what we saw there was the growth of these for-profit partners and why. Because post 9-11, I think the, um, NGO community was beginning to grapple with uh, the change in the world, right? Around uh, here we have our principles, right? We have our, our humanitarian principles, and you're asking us to do what? We're going to go to, you're going to go invade uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and then we're going to go support you, and you're going to displace all these people, and then we're going to take care of them, right? And I think many of them kind of grappled with this. But on the political transition side, the four provinces didn't have a problem with that, right? And they were easier because of the way that we contracted with them. Uh, you could specify what you wanted them to do and it was, and, and then they would go do it. Um, so I think, you know, over the years, I think the NGOs have also adapted to this world, this post 9-11 world. Obviously, if you look at Syria, 
they, you know, they they were there. They're they, they're there, um, and I think it's it's. Um, but it remains a major debate within the community around those principles, right? Um, I was just, I just, one of my colleagues teaches a, a class in a conflict and humanitarian assistance. And so I sat in on his class the other day and, and he was, you know, he's, that's, the, it was like the third class of the term. And, he, you know, he's teaching the humanitarian principles, right? The basic principles in which we do humanitarian assistance. And, and the principles are still valid. The challenge is that how do you apply those uh, when you go into a conflict where it is a conflict in which the you get paid by the group that helps bring about the conflict, and that that is the that's one of the real challenges we have. I think the other thing that makes it a little bit difficult is if you look at something like Somalia, right? So in the context of Somalia, you, you, have, you have everybody doing the relief thing, but you got a lot of military people running all over the country, right? So it's one thing if you're out kind of doing your relief thing, but the fact is that those, you will often intersect with people because the militaries, our military and other militaries are out hunting down Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab or whoever it is, and you're a relief guy taking care of the displaced people, except you don't know if some of the Al-Shabaab guys are in your camp. Just, that's what happened in, after Rwanda and, you know, in Eastern, but that is the problem for groups, I think, and how do you balance your responsibility of neutrality and independence with the guy who's out hunting uh, people in your camp. And that is, I, I think, one of the real challenges that uh, a lot of the NGOs have. And I don't, think it's an, I don't think it's a problem that's readily solved. Because as long as, as the basis of our humanitarian assistance is around those principles, there, there's going to be a clash. My name is Victoria Buteleva. I, I am a former local employee, employed staffer in the U.S. Consulate General in Vladivostok, Russia. I worked there for 23 years until my immigration to the U.S. I am here for two years, and I found that, yes, I'm a U.S. permanent, legal permanent resident. I have just tremendous background, professional expertise, and I'm overqualified for many jobs. But for other jobs, I am not a U.S. citizen yet. It's another problem. What is your advice for those who are not Americans yet, but they are real Americans in their minds? Thank you. Well, I would say, you know, you, you, you need to read up on all your baseball statistics, but I'd say that's not quite, um, you know, that's my prejudice. You know, I think for people that, um, uh, probably with all your skills, I mean, I had said to people years ago that I, I do think, you know, oftentimes, you, you look one way. I, I was fortunate in that I came up in a time when, basically, when I went out, I had no skills. I mean, yeah, okay, they, they liked the fact that I had a law degree, but I didn't know anything about, I'd never lived in Africa, I'd, none of that. So I think it's a different world now with where people go out and they're better, much better educated, whether you're a public health person or you've trained in international studies or you are a systems analyst, whatever you are. Um, but I do think that one of the, uh, you know, for this business, I still think it's pretty true that being willing to go out to a difficult place, and I've given that advice to lots of people, if you're willing to go to a difficult place, um, people are more likely to hire you in the sense of it's hard to fill those posts, right? So when I was, one of my last trips was to my Duguri before I left the U.S. government. So I was in northern Nigeria, and people said, you know, we can't get qualified people. Qualified people won't come here, right? So who comes? Adventurers? So imagine, was, so you know, what I'm, if you have that suite of skills, uh, but you've got a crowded field here, then I do think sometimes looking outward is, is a good way to go. I mean, you might not like my degree very much, but once you kind of earn your stripes, people, you know, it's easier to choose where you want to go and what you want to do. Plus, you might get out there and like it, so you never, 
You never know. Um, but that's kind of how I see it. I, I've always felt that it's, it's still as true as when I told people this 20 years ago, I think, as it is now. Global Health Policy Center, and I was hoping you could speak more about your field experience in food security and nutrition specifically. Great. Um, well, um, I think for me, you know, I, I got into, the, I mean, I started my career doing basically relief, you know, just food relief is what we were doing. And then, then I got into a beekeeping program. That was awesome. Uh, I really like that. but. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in aid was we, we divested from agriculture and food security. We really did. We sort of left food security to the, you know, a little bit food for peace, but we just said, oh, go feed those people if they're hungry. That was, our, that was kind of our food security program. And we had the famine early warning system, and it's grown to, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be an alum of it. It's grown. It's 30 years old, and it's doing great work. But I think my career in feed the f in, in famine early warning um, really deepened my understanding of all the elements around hunger, right? I mean, it's, there's d d what serves as proxies for when crisis is, is about, is, is coming. Uh, how, do you me how do you measure that? How do you measure uh, the vulnerability of a community? Uh, we see this, you know, and right now if you look at East Africa, over and over again we've had these back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back droughts. So what's the vulnerability of that community? Um, that's, there are, we finally, in fact, it was uh, Bill and I that started the Bureau for Food Security at, at, at USA. And um, I, I think that the administration was on to the right thing. That is, with growing population in the world, um, there are, there is a huge issue, how do you keep feeding people? How do you produce enough food of quality and of the right amounts and of the right type that enables people to, um, uh, you know, to have enough to eat? Um, and I felt like it was for me to go from a lot of emergency work and early warning work to the sort of the production side and then even I, one of the things I helped oversee was the private sector work that we were trying to do. That is trying to bring, bring the private sector into um, uh, areas of production that we were interested in. And uh, what, I, what I've seen in the last few years is, of course, when the administration under, under President Obama was really focused on this, we got a lot of attention on this at the World Economic Forum. Um, we had, uh, we, it was the top, the top thing that we looked at in the G8, G20. So food security, I think, got a lot of attention uh, for a while. My, the challenge we have now is though Congress has now fully funded, or, or is, there's a bill, it's not funded, but it, there's a bill about food security. The question really for us is um, whether we can keep this as an issue of huge importance. There's no doubt that we we continue to um, innovate, right? A lot of our money goes into research. Of the roughly $800 million that's there in Feed the Future now, probably 300 million of that's tied up in research. So there's a lot going on there, and I think it represents uh, what we want to do. The question for us is whether other donors maintain the same in level of interest. And I think with anything like this, um, uh, it's, it's easy for something else to arise that seems to be more important. I mean, HIV has huge amounts of funding, right? Because it's, a pretty, it's pretty evident. You take away the medicine, they die, right? It's, it's, a, it's a real simple calculation. So even though that budget's come down, it's still around $5 billion, which is a massive amount of money. But food security, even with the attention of all these famines, I do think that it's something that you need to, there, there needs to be advocacy for it. That's what I've seen. If you don't continually advocate for it, 
and also show your successes and what you've done, then attention gets distracted and gets moved to something else. And I would, um, not just because we started the Bureau for Food Security, but because it's such a crucial issue, right? And you also have, it's even more crucial because there are, there are, the, the migration patterns are for cities, right? People move into cities. So what's going on out in the, what's going on out there? Who's, who, who's gonna farm? Who's gonna grow that food? How's that gonna get done? Is that a, you know, these, these are debates that we had within food. Is it, is it, do we turn to Monsanto? Or do we, who are we then gonna work with out there, right? And the, these are, it's, it's a, to me it's a, it's just a huge issue and coming from, you know, spending two years in Pakistan, which still had a growth rate of around three and a half percent and 44% of their kids are stunted. Um, you know, there are many countries in the world in which food security remains, it's, it's just a basic, basic issue. Never mind all the people that are facing famine and right now. But I do think that it, it requires, um, it, it's, it's gonna require advocacy and, and um, kind of a balanced outlook, right? I do, I do think that uh, we are not gonna be able to, it would be great if we could all be small farmers again, but that's not gonna happen, right? Um, so it's, you, you, you have to have, I think you, there's sensitivity around what's the commercial side of this, what does that mean, and what is it for the, what, what is it to have the small farmer, and how can we balance that? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lauren Carter from World Food Program USA. Um, so with the growing humanitarian crisis, it, it does, one does get worried a little bit about donor fatigue, um, especially when more funding is needed on the development side. And um, so I kind of have a question about how, um, how do you advocate for that when there are sometimes data shortages um, sometimes? And then if someone wants to move kind of from humanitarian field to development, um, what skills do you bring with you to um, kind of convince the development folks that, you know, your experience is, is needed for them. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll just put in a plug for, I just had an article in DevX yesterday on, um, it was actually on humanitarian leadership, but it goes to the issue of leadership around these current crises. So yeah, you know, I'm kind of, a, the way I kind of look at the leadership issue around this is that whoever is in a leadership position. So in, when I was the acting assistant administrator, so particularly because I came from the US, you know, and we had a big, we had a robust budget, as you know, right? So, you know, I could pick up the phone and call pretty much whoever I wanted to call. If I wanted to call the head of OCHA, I called them, right? And they, they would take my call. Same with my counterpart at DFID or ECHO or, and one of the things that I was very keen to do, particularly with and work closely with Mark Lowcock on, who's now at OCHA, is the convening of sort of side, side meetings of donors off the record um, to discuss a current crisis and get the major donors around the table to make sure we're all on the same page, to make sure that what we want to bring back to our funders was the same story the same sense of what's the magnitude, what's the urgency, right? Where are we currently in terms of how we're set up? What more do we need in the field? What, what, where are we, fail, you know, where are we weak? It was also to take a look to, you know, if you're World Food Program, you know, we might hammer you about, you, you're not doing this or FAO, we're gonna, you know. And NGOs are around the table as well, major NGOs, so we can get those voices. But I, I think that in a time when there is huge amounts of need. We're only meeting about 60% of those. Um, and I don't, wanna sit, I don't wanna put it in the context of saying, oh, you know, yeah, we fund 60%, that's pretty good. Yeah it's, yeah, it's good if you're sitting here. If you're out there waiting for something to come, it's, you know, 60% is, yeah, it's not that good. 
So my feeling is that senior managers, senior leaders in governments and wherever have to really, you have to be very active. You have to advocate. You have to, uh, you have to work closely with your colleagues. You have to not be afraid to push your colleagues. You can get on that plane and go and, you know, Bill done it a hundred times, I've done it, Mike's done it. You get on the plane, you go to Brussels and you say to the EU, come on, we need you on board. That to me is one of the things the US does because we're the largest financial donor, we, we hold that position and it's important to do that. Beasley does this, right? He's on a plane all the time, flying around. What's he doing? He's advocating for more for them. And, and unless you do that, unless you put it in front of people, it's easy to ignore it, right? And the other thing is, you, we know that if we don't get the right amount of money and people and, in place, right, then it just blows up, then it's even worse. So it's the resp our responsibility is to try to get it to not be on the front pages, right? And we try, and, and the other thing is that with the advances in early warning, we can, uh, we can see ahead of time what we think is coming, right? We have enough history to say, we, we can see what's coming. We can kind of, let's just guess at the magnitude. And even if we're 75% right, it's gonna be bad anyway. So let's get on it, let's get a jump on it now. And I, th I do think that part of it is to try to convince people that if you invest early, right, it's an investment. You, we, what we're trying to do, even if you went in there and you said, okay, we're gonna fix all these water systems and we're gonna do these health things with kids, and, the, and it starts raining and it's great, was it a waste of money? No, because your, your point is that we have helped make this, the, the community more resilient, right? The, to, to the next thing, right? They didn't have to sell off any assets up to this time or anything. So I, I really, I just became a huge believer in using whatever um, uh, political clout you have uh, to go out and, and really advocate for it. And, I, and you just, if you don't do that, um, it's easy for your funders to say, well, it's not that big a problem. As for how do you shift to development world? Um, I mean, you know, uh, I was able to do it um, mostly because I was considered a good manager, decent manager. And so um, Pakistan was, well, I was willing to go to Namibia because I don't, for some reason nobody wanted to go there. And I, I thought, in part because PEPFAR was so hard to work in, it was so complicated and, you know, people were strangling each other, as you know. Um, but, um, uh, but part of it was that, um, you know, I had also studied development at Harvard. So I hadn't studied humanitarian assistance, so I'd studied it, right? And I had actually, in my, early in my career, I'd actually written a food security plan based on my economic, you know, skills that I acquired. So I had some of those, right? I, I, was, I was a little bit more balanced. And I think that, uh, but mostly it was, you know, I had developed leadership skills and I understood and was interested enough in what those colleagues were doing. I wasn't, I wasn't, I understood, I think, relatively early in my career that there was, that we needed to combine that, that um, relief and development, there, there was a synergy there. One of the things I did in my, when I was, Bill had already gone off to, had retired, but I actually started a donors group that still exists now, it's five years later, on resilience, right? So I was so mad about the drought, again, I was so mad, I said, I don't know how many droughts I've done in East Africa. But I went out and I spent two years just constantly traveling to try to get donors around that issue. But you just acquire that understanding, right? I think you can, you can do it, and also with, within your institution, you know, you can raise your hand and take a job that you think is an oddball kind of job, but that that job gives you insight into that other side. And then you've, you're, you're a real good balance and a really good mix. So it's possible. Here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Gibson Arsal. I'm an intern with the Kurdistan Regional Government's representation in the United States. And I was wondering if you could expand on how you went about forming connections with communities and places you've been, like Uganda or Malaysia. Um, 
Well, part of it is, um, I mean, in, when I was in Malaysia with the UN, I think we were, we were a bit isolated. So because we were there to do, um, we, were, we were actually vetting Vietnamese, right, to see if they were going to get refugee status or not, which was, but part of it was, I mean, we knew that was going to be a tense time because if people got vetted out of the system, they were going back to Vietnam. We had people commit suicide when they got vetted out. It was not pretty. Um, but part of that was to, to get to know the, you know, you have to, you've got to get to know the leaders of the community, right, of that. They had their own community on Palau Bidong, which was an island. And I think one of the things that, as the lawyers, what we wanted to do was to make sure the, that the community understood what our, what our job was and was not, and what we could do for them and what we couldn't do for them. We were, we did not conduct the hearings. We were the appellate lawyers, if they, you know. So we tried to, we tried our best to get people to understand that and to sh come regularly to the island to make sure they saw us, that if people wanted to talk to us, we could just move through the camp. And so we were open to that. I do think that, um, you know, part of it is that you have to show a kind of uh, willingness to sit and talk and lis really listen. And I think that, um, I, I think of one real example in my career, I had taken, uh, I was in Kenya and I'd taken a congressional delegation to the big Somali refugee camp, uh, the DAB. I think we had 250,000 people or something. And they were mad about something and it was not, you know, so we took the guys to the camp and they, we, we went around and then as we got into the vehicle to go, we were surrounded by, you know, thousand people. And what they really wanted to do was just talk, right? And the, I could see that the congressman was, uh, he was not going to get out of that car, right? So, so I got out of the car and I just went and I sat down and I said, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's hear about it. Let, well, you know, what's the issue? I could have been trampled to death, but, uh, you know, I think over time you develop a sense of what people want. And when big shot, when you take big shots to a camp, I mean, people want to talk. They, 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 they have issues. You're, you're stuck in a camp in the middle of nowhere. You don't think you got issues? So um, I think over time, I, you know, I, 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 I was lucky to meet people along the way who could also introduce me to communities. I, there was, I spent a lot, I've spent a lot of time in northern Kenya in the uh, pastoralist areas because of the droughts and stuff. And I was fortunate to meet a woman who's actually an American woman who was married to a tribesman. And through her and her language skills and her cultural skills, um, I had tremendous access to the community. But it meant that, you know, sometimes we'd, we'd walk miles and miles and miles to a community to sit down and talk to people. And I think part of it is when you come to a place when you have lots of, you know, you're the, you're the money machine, right? You're the, you're the ATM. Um, you know, the, you're not going to solve problems just because you can throw money at it. You're going to solve a problem because you actually understand how the community works and what's best. Because, the, you know, there's the, there's the notion of, of do no harm, which means, you know, from Mary Anderson and her group, and that has been around with us for a while, but it's, it's about as good of advice as you can get. That is, I can do things in a community and I can make a hash of it because I don't have the patience to sit there. The other thing is, in, in a world of conflict, so in insecurity, how do you get out to the communities? And I think that's one of the real challenges now is, is how, who, do you, who is it you can talk to? Because I think in Pakistan, one of the biggest issues was most of our staff could not get out. Even, our, even many of our Pakistani staff could not get out, right? Um, so it was even hard for them to understand what some of the community issues were. So that, I think, is one of the, going to be one of the big challenges in the future because of the the development of our fathers, where you went out to the field, where you spent your time in the field, where that's what you, that's what you did, um, it's much harder to do that because who are you talking to? Like, if I said, if in Pakistan, I ended up, I was talking to the ministers all the time, right? I'll go talk to the minister, he'll tell you how it works. Yeah, well, he's a politician, right? 
If you're only able to meet the politicians, you are, you know, their worldview is a little different, right? It's, it's, it's how do you balance all that out? And it's not that you're not going to talk to them. You are, right? Because you're doing a government-to-government -government thing. But your ability to sort of step back and really understand how you might better do something, I think, is, makes it harder because you can't, go to, you can't get out to the communities. So something to think about. And just the final. Yeah, Thomas Ward, I'm an economist. Um, I was at the bank for many years. Uh, with the annual meetings coming up next week and all the talk of restructure of international development here in the U.S., what would be your message? Um, one of my messages would be don't break your tools, um, particularly on the humanitarian side, which was one of the things I was able to say before I left. I think that there are some things that work really well but I would say to the bank, um, I think one of the big issues that they have right now is um, I think that the bank itself has to begin to be a better partner around these big crises. And I think that Guterres and Jim Kim, we had a meeting, it was in April that they hosted. Um, where the bank has, is putting up funds for things. And my, I've always been a little bit leery of those funds in the sense of, that's great that you have money, how are you gonna use it? In what circumstance? We couldn't get them off the mark during the drought in Malawi a couple years ago. Couldn't just, could not get them to budge. And so I think there's, I, I would, what I would say to them is, if you wanna engage on this, then you need to have a consistent structure inside the bank that actually deals with this, that isn't floating around just over here somewhere, and there's a constant change of personnel which has driven me mad. If they want to do it, then I think they have to really get clear on what their role is and how they can help with these huge crises. That's number one. The other part of it is, that I would say to the broader community, the development community, um, I think we have to understand what, the, what changes are going on in our own institutions and what is relevant. Like if you're at USAID, 60 to 65% of all money is in two categories. You're either doing health or you're doing emergencies. So what does that tell you about the world in which you're, and, and most of that money's on, a, on HIV, which is a pandemic. So I think that we are, living in a, we're, we're living in a world where the problems that we're addressing are, you know, it's a little bit, they're still as big as they've ever been, but where we put our money has been greatly narrowed. And I, I'd like to see us uh, within that context understand how do we better integrate a lot of the things that we do into those crises, because I don't think we do a very good job of it. So I'm not coming to the meetings. <laughs> Well, uh, this has been an interesting...